What's up everybody, welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we'll be looking at the latest from filmmaking duo Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. The trippy sci-fi that's like H.P. Lovecraft and David Lynch had a love child. The Endless, where two former members of a so-called UFO death cult are drawn back in a decade later, leading to some strange and otherworldly occurrences. I'm a big fan of the duo, not only because they make consistently interesting and unique films, but also because of how much they personally do on each project, which you gotta respect. They co-directed the movie and the script was written by Benson, while Moorhead acts as cinematographer and heads up the visual effects. And this time, both even star in the movie as well. These guys really do everything. It's impressive and makes it feel like everything they produce is truly their own creative vision. And The Endless, their third film, is a triumph in many regards. In particular, the cinematography, which boasts a look much higher than its budget would suggest, and a memorable score which is perfect at setting the ominous and at times epic tone of the story. If you haven't watched Benson and Moorhead's previous films, you should because they're great, but in particular their first film, Resolution, which actually ties into The Endless in several ways. And the two act as companion pieces to further develop and flesh out the filmmakers ideas. So there is a lot to look at with this one and many mysteries and concepts introduced to explore. As such, let's begin by looking back to Resolution, which establishes some important aspects of the film's universe. Resolution tells the story of two friends, Michael and Chris. Chris is a down and out junkie who lives in a remote cabin, and after somehow receiving a tape and map from his old friend, seeing he's looking pretty cracked out, Michael decides to go to the cabin and try to help him get clean. He does so by literally handcuffing Chris to a pipe in the cabin and then begins the process of detox, which Chris isn't exactly thrilled about though they become more wrapped up in something else strange going on, as they get video messages from something or someone watching them. Some of these messages seem like warnings, or trying to help them, such as a video showing them being beaten to death by junky friends of Chris's. Since they see this first, they are able to change courses to avoid their fates. Over the course of the movie, we are presented with several red herrings about who or what is watching them, including cave drawings implying some kind of cursed burial ground situation, or at one point, possibly aliens, when Michael comes across three members of what they call a UFO death cult. This turns out to not be true, but two of these characters, Aaron and Justin, who looks like the spitting image of Alan Partridge here, go on to become the two main characters years later in The Endless. As for Michael and Chris, after a week at the cabin, Chris is successfully detoxed. And while both hide outside of the cabin, again missing their own demises, as the man they rented the cabin from returns as promised, and promptly kills the same two junkies inside, and proceeds to set the cabin ablaze. Throughout the movie, Chris maintained that Michael isn't as righteous as he is presenting, and he he finally admits at the end that he came here to help Chris for his own selfish purposes, wanting to help him to make him feel better about himself. After this admission, a large unseen force appears looming over them, and Chris falls to his knees, the movie abruptly concluding at this moment, leaving their ultimate fates unknown. That is, until they return as minor yet important characters later in The Endless. The entity watching them is never explicitly defined but we pick up what its motivation is, essentially using Michael and Chris as pawns to create its own story, manipulating them to do its bidding. And with Michael's final admission of being selfish, that is the conclusion of their story, its resolution. You could consider the entity to be a god, or at the very least a god, as it is omnipotent and clearly possesses supernatural powers. But to look at it from another perspective, the entity is actually representing the audience itself, as we are the ones that have the omnipotent view of these characters, just like the entity does, and their lives and stories are created for our own amusement, making it almost kind of a statement on movies themselves, or a meta movie if you will, a movie about movies. We only get a basic understanding of what this god is in Resolution, and the concepts are further developed and the story's scope broadened in The Endless, picking up 10 years after Resolution. Soon after, Justin dragged Aaron away from the cult they belonged to, believing they were on the verge of some kind of mass suicide a Heaven's Gate scenario, though he doesn't have any actual proof of this, and they will be drawn back to the camp now, when the entity up to his old tricks sends Aaron a tape in the mail, featuring a goodbye message from another member from the camp, Anna. To Justin, this proves that he was right about the mass suicide, but was only 10 years later than he originally suspected, while Aaron, after seeing the tape, wants to go back to the camp, remembering only the good times when they were there. It seems their life since leaving the cold has been exceptionally crappy, the two only managing to get 
menial work cleaning houses and being perpetually broke. But Justin still believes it's for the best for the two to be in the real world, initially refusing to allow them to return. And this dynamic between the two brothers illustrates a core theme of the movie, control. Justin is the one that made them leave and is now not allowing Aaron to do what he wants. He doesn't treat Aaron as an equal, and believing he is always right in his choices has total control over his brother. Though Justin begins to feel sympathy for Aaron, as since the group is still alive, it appears that he took them away for no reason. Justin finally relents, giving permission to go to the camp for one night in order to get Aaron closure and hopefully get him out of his rut. We don't get too much on Justin and Aaron's backstory, but get some development when they pull over to a monument on the side of the road, which is where their mother was killed in a car accident many years ago when they were both kids. It was then that they were rescued from the burning car and taken to the camp all those years ago. Aaron notes the childlike drawing there, saying it must be new based on its condition. But Justin remembers putting it there as kids after the accident, and somehow it still looks brand new all these years later. This is because this area is contained within a time dome of sorts, and time works very differently around here, which we learn more about over the course of the story. They are welcomed back to the camp by the de facto leader, Hal, saying it's good to see them and giving Aaron a hug, while Justin opts instead for a cold handshake. At dinner, Justin begins to point out that everyone at the camp looks exactly the same as 10 years ago, but is interrupted by Hal, saying it's just the clean living, another effect of the time dome that surrounds the camp. They never age past when they initially arrive. Later, Hal takes Justin to his cabin to try out some of the camp's different beers, seeing a map on the wall with circles drawn around specific areas. Is. Our first indication that there are in fact multiple of these time domes around, with the camp being one of them. And Justin gets his first clue that there are bigger forces at play in bringing them back. Hal asks why they return now, and Justin of course says because of the tape they sent. But Hal insists he didn't send it, and turns to praising the camp, and poking holes into Justin's false beliefs about them, saying people stay here and grow into being who they want to be, and that something bigger is out there, telling Justin it will soon become evident. But he still isn't buying the story story of this god that they worship. However, he is soon subjected to a few inexplicable events that prove that something else is definitely here. First being subjected to a magic trick from Shane taking a baseball and throwing it into the air, where it stays up much longer than should be possible, cutting to a bird's eye POV from above. It's our old buddy from Resolution watching over the camp, and eventually it drops the ball landing right into Justin's open hand. It seems the god is playful, and even enjoys a game of tug of war like anyone else, a ritual of perseverance referred to by the group as the struggle, seeing a long rope that extends up into the dark sky, and not seeing what is on the other end of the rope. They convince Aaron to give it a try, who ultimately loses his grip on the rope, but rather than giving up, tries again, and after some serious tugging action is victorious, the other end of the rope going slack and falling to the ground. Nice job, Aaron! He didn't give up and believed in himself to best the god, which is a big part of the camp's philosophies, how the god can actually bring out the best in us. Next is Justin's turn, and unsurprisingly, as he isn't believing anything here, totally blows it and is yanked to the ground instantly, showing us how out of touch with himself Justin is at this point. While again, Aaron is becoming a stronger person. We never see what is in the darkness, but over the film are presented with various characters' interpretations of it, like this camp member seeing it as two eyes swirling in a darkness over the camp. She mentions first coming to the area because of a tweaker with guns that she used to be obsessed with, referring to Chris from Resolution, showing a relationship existed at some point between these characters. Aaron's really feeling the camp vibes and wants to stay longer, and Justin, in his words, allows him to stay one more day. What a total control freak! The entity then says, sets its sights on the non-believer Justin. First when out shooting, Aaron has no trouble hitting the can, but when Justin tries, he misses repeatedly, and one bullet is even flattened on the end as though it hits something, but nothing is visibly seen. Soon after, he heads out for a jog, and the god gets a lot more direct in his communication. A huge blast of dust blowing out, and the sun blinks to dark for a moment, and when it returns, there is a circle of photographs all around Justin. As he confusedly picks one up, something breaks through the trees behind him unseen but would have to be quite large based on the destruction. Justin talks to Hal about what he found, and wants Hal to tell him what it is. In response, Hal tells him to go and find it himself, that the photo is telling him what to do, to go to the specific buoy scene and grab whatever is at the bottom of the water. They look up to a strangely beautiful sight, two moons glowing
drawing in the sky. Hal explaining that it's a kind of atmospheric mirroring effect. And when there are three moons, that signals the ascension, which is what Justin thought was referring to their group suicide, but is actually tied to when the time loop at the camp ends, occurring every 10 years. And this ascension will be happening again very soon. While Aaron gets closer with Anna, they see the barrier around the camp, looking like a mirrored reflection of where they are. He asks if it's possible to walk through it, and Anna doesn't really respond, as she along with the others at the camp are physically unable to leave his boundaries after going through the loop, while Aaron and Justin are still able to walk through them. Later, Justin comes across a sobbing woman, Jennifer, sitting outside, who doesn't seem particularly happy to be here, explaining that she's only here in search of her missing husband, Mike, who disappeared. Mike from Resolution. And this confirms he never made it home after his time at the cabin with Chris. Though we don't learn specifically how long Jennifer has been here, but I would imagine based on how distraught and beaten down she is, it's been a few years at this point. The next day, the brothers go fishing, setting up at that spot from the picture Justin was given, and still convinced something untoward is going on here, thinks he'll find the answer to what it is at the bottom of the lake. He's under for quite some time before popping up looking frightened, as though he saw something under the water, having retrieved a rusty box from below. And indeed, it looks like something is lurking in the lake seeing an absolutely massive inky black shadow under the water as they head to shore. Inside the box, they find an old tape, which immediately spurs Justin to wanting to leave. And Aaron decides to go along with him, but asking to at least say their goodbyes like normal people first. The group is sad to see them go, and Hal asks them to allow a viewing of the message they received from the god. On the tape is the same moment from Resolution 10 years ago where younger Justin and Aaron met Michael, hearing that even back then that Justin had his own beliefs about the camp, as there isn't actually proof of it being a UFO death cult as he describes to Michael. This leads Hal to believe that the meaning of the message is forgiveness, for Justin's consistent lies about the cult over the years, and more truths quickly come out. And Hal pinpoints Justin's problems even in the past, that he was unwilling to give up control to the greater entity they all worship. He wanted to control himself, and was unsatisfied with the vague answers he was given about the god. Things heating up, Hal suggests Justin leave the camp, but when asking Aaron to go with him, he decides to stay sending Justin off into the night alone, which around these parts could lead to some pretty crazy stuff. It's not long until he gets lost, and stumbles upon a cabin which is contained in its own time dome, with a duration of only three hours. That means this one poor bastard living here, the illustriously named Shitty Carl who was mentioned in both Resolution and Spring, is forced to relive his life in three hour cycles, or as he describes it as a looped prison, repeating over and over, making stories for that thing, referring to the deity control controlling everything which he flips off in anger. And through Carl, we first learn that after the loop, even though the surroundings and people reset, those within the barrier keep their memories each time. And it's clearly getting to Carl, as each time the god kills you, he instead elects to kill himself saying that if it does it, it's much worse. Seeing that he has already done this previously, his hanging body inside the cabin from a former loop, which is a pretty grim reminder of his inescapable situation. Seeing that eternal life maybe isn't all it's cracked up to be. Back at the camp, the old prospector looking member, Tim, tells Aaron he doesn't have to do it if he doesn't want to. If he stays in the camp after the third moon, he will effectively be here forever. And while that does, as Hal said, allow the members to grow into who they wanna be, but for Tim, who is clearly been here the longest of the camp members, perhaps for several hundred years, that eternal pursuit of striving for perfection is impossible to ever truly achieve. We see this as he's the brewmaster of the camp and earlier is seen tossing a glass out in disgust. To him, it's not quite right, and he has come to realize after so much time, it's never truly possible. And this is what he's warning Aaron about here in his decision to stay. Even with all the time he has, perfection is impossible. Back with shitty Carl, he sends Justin on a mission to a so-called bitch-ass tweaker's cabin, showing he has his own time dome, wanting a gun in exchange for a map back to camp. The next day, the entity then leaves communication with Aaron, seemingly sending him to find Justin, letting him know it's watching him along with a picture of a trailer. And Hal tells him which way to go to get there, warning about needing to find his brother before the third moon. Justin then arrives at the tweaker's cabin, which of course is referring to Chris from Resolution. So they never got out of the forest and are also in their own specific loop, which for them lasts one week, the same duration as Mike's original detox plan. The god continues to communicate with them as well, Mike unearthing a hard drive, which features as before a possible outcome of their deaths. They hope one of these possible outcomes will help them get free. But we 
already know that's not happening. And at this point, the two are already exasperated at reliving the same weekly loot. Though Chris has some important advice to Justin. Don't give in to the entity. If you allow it control once, then it takes control for you from then on out. As we saw, he bowed down at the end of resolution, effectively giving it control. Being killed by the entity as well as giving into it seemed to be how it is that Chris and Mike wound up stuck. And even though after talking more with Mike, he realizes that Jennifer he met at camp is his wife, Justin elects not to mention anything about her to him for some reason, perhaps thinking it would be best for him to keep hoping that he can escape and get back to Jennifer. As a final encouragement of sorts, Mike tells him he hopes he doesn't get stuck too and proceeds to pour gasoline everywhere and lighting the cabin on fire, burning them both alive as Justin watches from afar. And just then, the loop resets. Boop! The cabin returning to normal. And just as began the story in Resolution, see the same events occur, with Michael approaching an agitated and armed Chris, hiding behind a truck. Their week has started from scratch once again. Elsewhere, Aaron happens across what looks like a Civil War era tent, inside seeing a man living by far the shortest loop of mere seconds, beginning with him sitting in a chair and futilely rising only to then reappear in the chair as the record player inside skips back, seeing on the clock outside as each loop resets. This seems like the most horrific fate ever, replaying the same three seconds until the end of time, unable to even get out of the chair before resetting. Man, that would be maddening. And it's hard to pinpoint exactly how old this guy is, but is at least as old as Tim, or maybe even older. At least a couple hundred years that he's been going through this. Justin is still lost, or perhaps is going exactly where the god wants him to. As he passes through another time dome barrier, a trailer manifests. The same one Aaron was venturing towards. And right on cue, out of the barrier around the trailer, Aaron appears. The trailer which was first seen in Resolution, where Michael met a French researcher who smoked a strange red flower also seen smoked by the members at the camp. So somehow the two are connected, or at least were at one point. He was there as part of a team researching the strange going ons in the area and mentions that many people over the years have come to this spot to understand what is out there in the forest. Somehow he is nowhere to be found, finding only a note left behind indicating a date, but no specific year. Nearby a projector whirs to life, seeing on the screen the same moment that we just saw of Justin and Aaron. The deity is watching them right now, and does doesn't seem pleased, hurling the projector into the air. And as the shot pans over, seeing a wide vista, peppered amongst the landscape are several time domes. This area is littered with them, way more than we have seen at this point at the very least and who knows just how many of them there are out there. We do get some indication of how long it has been around the area at least, as Justin and Aaron stumble across a graveyard of statues, showing us different cultures over many years' respective interpretations of the god. This scene also just looks really cool and kinda otherworldly, which impressively was all done with miniatures. They leave the gun for Carl and get the map back to camp, Carl immediately using the gun to kill himself. Well, happy to help, bud. Before heading back, Aaron tells his brother that he's decided to stay for good, which now that they know what's going on, Justin thinks is even crazier. Justin at first tries to press him to reconsider, but eventually relents. Arriving at the camp, they find everything conspicuously uninhabited, only seeing Jennifer who rolls past on her bike, and then Tim who unlocks the mysterious cabin marked with a three, allowing the brothers to enter. Inside seeing a huge library of messages on all kinds of mediums from the deity over the years all the way back to 1945 at least, completely stacked and overflowing in the tiny room. On the TV, images flash from several scenes earlier, all communicating that the god was watching them at all these various times, then seeing the communal bonfire where the group is all gathered now, and Aaron realizing the ascension is about to happen, rushes out to them, but it's too late. They have already been killed as the three moons are in the sky, and only their clothes remain left behind. In this moment, after everything that's happened, Justin has finally started to come around on this whole control thing, saying he'll stay behind too, as he would feel guilty to leave his brother here. But surprisingly, instead of wanting to stay himself, Aaron gets up and says he's ready to go, because all he really wanted was for his brother to respect his decision, something he hasn't been too good at so far. But their tender brotherly breakthrough is interrupted by a massive destruction. As the god approaches their direction, the car is unable to start, so they both push it trying to get it into gear. When Aaron suggests driving, Justin agrees 
unlike before where he was adamant on driving himself. Aaron emotionally telling his brother that he always messes everything up. And all he wanted was to mess things up together. As the horizon explodes into fire behind them, Justin agrees, telling him from here on out we're equals. And both hop into the car, getting it started and flooring it with the entity hot on their trail. They're rapidly getting to the camp's dome's barrier, watching birds bounce right off, but continue onward, screaming as they crash into it and it appears to shatter. The two then manifesting back on the road where they came in. They made it out! I initially wondered if they were actually only resetting with the camp's loop and didn't actually escape. But the evidence is there that they did indeed make it out. They're told by those trapped not to ever give the deity control and also to not let it kill you. As this didn't happen to either of the brothers, this allowed them to pass the barrier. Even though the third moon was in the sky and ascension, aka the reset, occurred with them still in the barrier. This is also backed up with our final moments with the newly resurrected camp group starting at the beginning once again of their 10 year loop. They all gather looking out onto the road, obviously expecting or hoping to see Justin and Aaron, but after waiting, understand they won't be coming back. So we see they did escape and in their last interaction, see what's even more important that's happened. Justin points out that they need gas, but Aaron blows it off, saying it's always like that. And instead of not letting it go, Justin relaxes saying he'll leave it to him to figure it out. As we see, their dynamic has been completely changed because of their experiences at camp. Justin now seeing him as a brother and not someone he has to tend to and control 24 seven. In a sense, they have broken their interpersonal loop and that's the real takeaway from the ending. And just to clarify, the reason that God sent the tape in the first place is because it knew the ascension or loop reset was coming soon. The last one took place 10 years ago when they left and now that it's about to happen again, is the perfect time to lure them back and hopefully keep them this time to act in its little stories for eternity. Too bad they made it out, sorry God. With that, we have reached the conclusion of this explained and analysis on The Endless. There is certainly a lot of depth and interesting things to consider in the movie. And I love when a story leaves you with lots to think about. And this certainly did that. While I did like how it connected to Resolution and expanded on its ideas, I am looking forward to Benson and Moorhead doing another original idea. Though there is still a lot of story to mine and questions left in the end if they choose to continue exploring this universe. Regardless, I'm looking forward to whatever these guys do next. What did you guys think of the Endless and its ending? Do you think Justin and Aaron actually escaped at the end? What's up with the God in the woods? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.